It is Wednesday afternoon, April 21st. Welcome to our third class in the Gospel and the Stars. We'll still do a quick review. Probably we'll review every week, but not always back to the beginning. But right now we're painting that picture. So just that quick overview that we are studying God's astronomy. We are not studying astrology. If you would look at your horoscope, throw that thing out. I would say out the window, but I don't want anybody else to get it. Flush it. <laughs> get rid of it. That's not what we're about, and it's not where we're going. But we do see God put his message in the stars, that it was there in the heavens before the written word that we pick up, hopefully daily, and open up and uh, hear his voice and, and get direction while he put it in the stars that everyone under the stars had opportunity to um, to be aware because God said he put his thumbprint into creation that man could know him. We see that he took Avraham outside to look at the stars, to narrate, to tell the story. This is Genesis 15. The story that the stars are telling, Psalm 19, 1 through about verse 6, tell us that the heavens are declaring. Same word Abraham was to declare. The heavens are declaring the glory of God, and Hebrews 1, 3 showed us the glory of God is none other than Yeshua Jesus himself, the express image closer than what you see in the mirror of God himself. We also saw from Genesis 15 the seed becomes singular, that the whole world would be blessed through the seed of Abraham that Galatians 3 tells us is Yeshua Jesus himself. Again, the declaration of the stars of heaven and our written word. We saw that Abraham believed in this. It says that he believed in the Lord. He didn't just believe what he was hearing, he believed in the Lord. This counted for righteousness. No one is ever justified or saved by works. We cannot earn it. It's the free gift God has given us, but when we have put our faith in the Lord, then we are saved. We saw that Yeshua Jesus gave testimony to this himself. It's recorded in Yochanan John 8 when he spoke of Avraham and said that Avraham saw his day and rejoiced. Well, was Avraham about, uh, what, 2,500 years old at this point? No, he had long since been buried in the cave of Machpelah. We even know where his grave is to this day. But he saw in the stars, as the testimony, the story was told, he saw the day coming of the seed, Yeshua Jesus, his earthly life, his death, burial, his resurrection, and that's what he put his faith in and what the Lord said he rejoiced in and had that faith to believe. We saw that Enoch knew things about the future, the second coming of Messiah, and he was only the seventh generation from Adam, so he was very early on in man's existence, and he knew things that were, were far beyond what he should have without the written word. How did he know? We're going to see also um, others that, that show us that. We saw that astrology today is Satan's counterfeit. That's all he can do is counterfeit. So he took God's plan, and he warped it, and he brings it to man to cause man to believe that the destiny of nations, the destiny of individuals is dependent on the stars and where the, the position of the stars in the sky and that's where your horoscope and all that comes in and that's out of the pit of hell. That's just directly where it comes, that's all there is to it. Western astrology does show us 12 signs or 12 houses in a year. The moon, the rotation of the moon through, we know the moon, there's a 30-day cycle. You see your new moon, your full moon, your waning moon, and, you know, it starts again. We see the division. Again, that part is truth. That's what the moon does. The word zodiac simply means the path that the sun takes through the elliptical path in the, the um, sky that we see in the course of a year. That part is right on, is what Satan took and did with it that brings you down to, oh, you're born under this sign, that means you're like this, and that means you need to do that. That's where it gets off. We discussed that astrological worship, rather than the worship of the one true living God, goes all the way back, that we see it with the Tower of Babel, that they were trying to build a, a monument to the heavens. They had the zodiac um, pictured in the top level, and they were worshiping it, not worshiping the God of heaven. 
We saw that the Egyptian plagues um, during Moshe's day was against their gods. They worshipped everything, frogs and and flies and everything else. We saw that when the golden calf was was made. what word do I want made? It, it it didn't just pop out like Aharon tried to say, but when it was formed, that it even was a reminder of the astrological sign of Taurus the bull, and it was worshiping that sign. We saw that they gave up the glory of Israel, which is Yeshua Himself, the promise of that that they gave up that glory. For a, a, an animal that eats grass, by default. Um, we see that carried down through Israel's history. Jeroboam, the first king when the country was divided, you had your northern kingdom and, and your southern kingdom, that, that because he didn't want people to go down to Jerusalem and <coughs> worship in the temple, he put two golden bulls in Bethel and in Dan, northern Israel, so that they would worship those. We see also the worship of Ares command, which is a sign of a goat. And we see um, goats that were, um, that archeologically have been found the same as the bulls that have been found that show worship of them. And it gets worse that they worshiped Moloch, even gave human sacrifice to Moloch, which is absolutely an abomination to God. They worshiped the sun. They called the sun God, what we call today Saturn. That's what the name originally meant. We see the worship of Aphrodite, of Venus, of Baal, the sun gods, the moon gods, all that command. And we know that the Babylonians were stargazers. We get that from Bereshit, Genesis chapter 10. You can see we haven't gotten far in civilization, and we've already got all of this astrological worship. Genesis 10 introduces us also to Nimrod. He dies. His wife gives birth to a son, calls his name Tammuz, said is Nimrod reborn. And we start with the worship of the sun god, Nimrod, and his son, Tammuz. You can see again, Satan's counterfeit. Constantine was uh, also a sun worshiper. Yes, Constantine worshipped the sun god also and even tried to emulate that and be like the sun god to the people. Uh, we see in between that time, though, from Genesis 10 to when Constantine was in there, we see that Israel went so far as in her temple to paint um, creatures and the zodiac and such and put those paintings on the walls of the temple go into the temple and worship those instead of worshiping the one true and living God in the temple how this shows me God's long suffering because why he didn't say oh yeah well I'll just zap you and show you who's God it, it had to taken God to not do that because I want to rattle their cages and say really are you kidding me especially in that that calf that they made after they came out of Egypt and they want to say this that they made just now got them out of Egypt anyway okay we see that there were divinations we saw that there were consultations which means they went to those who would divine you can see from that comes all the way down the day to our crystal balls and those who tell you they can tell you your future I ask you the question if they've got a message for you for your future why do you have to call them? Why aren't they finding you and telling you? Because if they've been given your message, they certainly ought to be able to know where you are, locate you, and tell you. And if anybody comes telling you that now, don't believe them either, because only God knows the future. But we see another good side. We see the side that we're going to study. We see the side that does not worship these things, these creatures, and the divisions that go down. Read Romans 1, how the base they became in their worship. Instead, we remain worshiping the one true living God, the God who created the stars, the planets, and all, and created them for a purpose, not just for the light that they give, but we're going to see that they were for times and seasons, and they were to be signifying something, and that's the part that we study. We know that Daniel, Daniel had wisdom from God, and it is believed that because he worked with the wise men of Babylon, that he taught them the right way to believe. He taught them this gospel and the stars, and that's how they knew at the right time, and we'll see how they knew that uh, uh, the king had been born, and they came to worship him, and that's our Yeshua Jesus. So uh, we see a lot that gives us the truth, and you just realize all Satan can do is pervert. How is there evil? Evil perverts what is good. 
Last week the question was raised, if God created everything, how can we have evil? Because how can a good and righteous God create evil? And you're not going to like my answer, but basically I, I have to tell you, we will never fully understand and answer that on the basis of human knowledge. We can say the absence of God's light brings that kind of darkness. But how we can, can say that nothing exists apart from God. So how we can say that, it just we fully cannot understand. If we could, then we'd be bringing God down to a human level. We'd be able to put him on our, our level and we'd be able to create him like people want to say we have done. But our God is not created by us. Our God is not fully understood by us, but we have been given enough understanding to trust him where we do not understand. The same way a little child in your house doesn't know how to run the household, doesn't know how to provide food and clothing and shelter for himself, but he wakes up every morning trusting his mommy and daddy to do that. Now, if you didn't have good parents who did that for you, I'm talking when you have the way it should be. We trust our God where we cannot understand, and we know that God is not evil, and he did not desire evil to be in our world. We're going to look at the creation that he made. We're going to look at the Garden of Eden. We're going to look and see what he created. And when we look to the millennium, we get a snapshot of what he wanted for the garden. And when we look to eternity future, it only gets better. It only gets better and better and better. And the thought hit me today, and I know it's not original, and it's not the first time I've thought it, but people wonder, what was God doing before he created us? I don't know. <laughs> and I'm not afraid to tell you. I don't know. But at one point in time, he decided to do this creation and to enter into this relationship with humans. So those of you who think you're going to be bored in heaven, well, hello. Do you really think God isn't going to keep doing new things? And do you really think you've got a mind that can figure out what God's going to do? I haven't seen you create anything yet. We haven't created one thing. Look at all God created and put into our world for us to enjoy. We have no clue what heaven holds. And it's still changing and, and more happening, I believe, the same way that we started at a point. I believe he's doing other things. So it's an exciting ride, and I'm ready to go and see that future. I don't know about you. But we clearly saw that God revealed to us in creation it was to reveal himself to us. We saw that in Romans 1. We saw it in Colossians 1. Um, I think also, I, I believe I read last time Romans 10, 17, and 18. If not, look that up on your own. And of course, Psalm 19, 1 through 6 is telling us that glory. Where we want to pick it up today is we were just talking about how the lights are significant. They are signs. Think of the word sign and significant. Well, how does significant start or signify? It starts with the word sign. In it. So that's what significant means, signifying. It is a sign. Bear sheet, Genesis 1.14, tells us the lights were to be signs. That's where we want to pick up. We looked at the first sign, excuse me, last week, but we're going to repeat that one because it's just the beginning of a list that we uh, can see, and I'm sure there's more than what we've got on our list. But uh, Bear sheet, Genesis chapter 1, verse 14 says... Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Okay, there you go. Sun and moon. We've got light for day and night. And they shall serve as signs and for seasons and for days and years. So we are seeing evidence of something more to come. It is not just that there's a sun to enjoy in the day and a moon to be lesser light by night, but they are signs of something, or I'm going to get very specific here, someone to come. So, okay. what are we looking at? What are we seeing in the signs? The first sign that we saw that we looked at last week was in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31. We'll pick up there and review just real fast. We're looking at verses 35 to 37. And we read there, Jeremiah 31, verse 35. Okay, there we go. This is what Adonai says, who gives the sun for light by day, the fixed order of the moon, and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so its waves roar. The Lord of hosts, Adonai Sava'o, the Lord of armies, is his name. 
if this fixed order departs, the sun, the moon, the stars, the waves of the ocean, if that departs, then the descendants of Israel will also cease to be a nation before me forever. So what's the sign to Israel? The sun, the moon, the stars, and the ocean. That's all the sign to Israel that you have a God who has promised you a future. Where it goes on in verse 37, it tells us if it can be measured or it can be searched out to its end, then God will reject Israel. And I love it. Science is constantly re, uh, re, um, re, re evaluating. Yeah. That's a good word, yeah. Um, where the heavens end. And they keep saying, oh, there's something more. Oh, there's something more. Oh, there's something more. And, and we don't know what's beyond that. Or we don't know what's in that black hole. We don't know how deep. We don't know how far. We don't know how long. And when you know that you can go 31 million light years out, and still see universes and, and stars and see an order to them. See in this one where a cross has even been put. I stand in awe. 31 million light years? That means you have to travel 186,000 miles an hour for 31 million years, and then you get to where those stars are. Does that blow your mind? It does mine. <laughs> <laughs> I just begin to realize how big that sky is, how enormous the heavens are. God is faithful, and in that same way, he's promised that the Jew will not see its full end. The Jew is indestructible as far as relation to these um, signs tell us. And we know that to be true. If someone asks you, prove to me there's a God, answer them with this. Look at the Jew. Because there would not be a Jew today if there were not the one true and living God of Israel. And I rest my case on the Jew alone. But we'll go on and we'll see that the signs and the stars and all also attest to the great glory and the great power of our Creator. You know, if He can create all of this, He's got a brilliant mind. And that's putting it mildly. Take the most brilliant person you've ever met or heard of or read about. Try to read some of, of their literature. And you know, at least I do, I know my mind can't comprehend it, but they're nothing compared to our, our God because he created it all. He created them and their mind, which makes him better than that. Again, the heavens are declaring the glory of God, the glory. How do you define his glory? How do we encapsulate that we cannot Moshe only could see what was left behind we can only begin to grasp a little bit of it and I feel very much like the little child trying to understand the whole world we just cannot we see again from Romans 1 18 to 20 let's just look real quickly that it, it's showing us this great glory of our God Romans 1 18 I probably won't read it all because I believe we did on um, in class last week, but uh, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungodliness, against unrighteousness, the people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Those who call God a liar, those who say there is no God, those who are trying to say this whole world just evolved, and the fallacy of that, they're the ones who this is against, who it's saying. They're speaking unrighteously, and God's wrath will fall on them in time because it's known about God. It's evident within them. God made it evident. How did he? Verse 20, since the creation of the world, and I don't think there's any human that, that came before the creation of the world. So this hits every single uh, one who was created. Sorry, forgot to clear it off, and that's yours. <laughs> um, this, this hits every single human being that it's saying then that, that his invisible attributes, this God we cannot see, his eternal power, how does all this stay in this order? How is it so orderly they can look back and say when the comets were and when the comets are coming and they hit it right on target, etc., etc., etc. How can all this be except that, that it clearly proves the divine nature of our God, that it can be understood by what he's made so that every single human is without excuse. God doesn't let anyone off the hook and say, well, you couldn't know, you couldn't understand because he said, look around you. It's there. And there's no one who exists 
who can't look around and see that it is there. So it is a testimony to the power of our Creator God. It's a testimony to His great glory. We read again in Yochanan John chapter 1, favorite verses, and you know these verses well yourself, that we want to see them in context of what we're talking about right now. Whoops, I went to John 11. Let's try John 1. In the beginning, okay, same words we have in Genesis, in the beginning. So God's taking us back to the beginning that we can understand. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. So we see it's not just that there was a written uh, book. We're talking about someone who is alive. He is the very Word of God. He expresses it. In the beginning he was with God and all things came into being through him. And apart from him, there's not one thing that came into being that has come into being. This is our God. In Colossians, we have the same testimony. This is by another author. Remember, the witness of two or three, let a thing be established. Build your court case. How can we prove? How can we know? We don't go on the hearsay of one person's words, but we can take these scriptures. We can see men from all walks of life throughout over 600 years in so many different backgrounds and so many different angles that they never come against each other. They never say it's the opposite of what someone else said. They say the same thing. The author in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 to 16, we read there. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness, transformed us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. Remember light. There's a significance to light. The light comes on. The light bulb goes on. We see that in our cartoons. Oh, ding! We get it, and the light comes on. Okay, what's transferred to his, the, his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This one, the Son of God, he is the image of the invisible God. How do we know God the Father in heaven? We know him by the Son who put on human form and lived on this earth. Again, it goes in then and tells us, for by him all things were created in the heavens, earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Same testimony as Genesis, same testimony as Yochanan John. We have everything cooperating, coming together, and I take you again to Hebrews 1, and Hebrews also tells us the same thing. We won't go through the verses in detail, but we just look quickly at verses 2 and 3, just the overall. He's spoken that God, it's telling us in verse 1, God spoke, the Father spoke from heaven in many different ways. In the last days, he spoke to us in his Son, that's Yeshua Jesus, and he tells you who that Son is, the one that he, he's appointed heir of all things. It all belongs to him. But it's also through him he also made the world. So he didn't just make it, but he inherits it. It becomes, it's, it's his own in the end also, in God's eternal plan. And verse 3 tells us again, he's the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature. When someone asks you, what's God in heaven like? Point them to Yeshua Jesus. That shows us what he was like. And he upholds all things by the power, by the word of his power. Okay, here again. How are, is our world staying in control? Why doesn't it fly off the handle? Why does gravity always work and not fail? Why do we have such an orderliness? Even those who do not want to accept our biblical view, but they see the fallacy of evolution, which says it all came together, it all developed, it took so many millions of years, but what, what needed to develop all at the same moment in time still was there. That doesn't make sense. And they say, okay, you're right. There's a master design, a master designer, but they don't yet want to acknowledge who he is. Again, I think a lot of that is pride. Uh-oh, if I say that there's a God, then I have to answer to that God. And I don't want to answer to that God. I want to do it my way. I'm doing just fine all on my own. Thank you very much. And that's the attitude of so many people. And they rob themselves of the relationship with the one who created them for joy. 
the one who created them to love them, the one who created them to be in that personal, intimate relationship, the one who will go through everything in life with them. It's hard enough to go through it with a support, with a, someone holding your hand. Why cut yourself off from the one who has control, who has power, who can turn evil to good, who can bring good out of bad things, the one who loves you so much that he gave his life for you and then resurrected to give you power in your life. Wow, why argue with that? Why turn away from that? Again, the signs not only show us his first coming, we'll see that the signs show us Messiah's second coming. Look with me real quickly at Luke. Luke chapter uh, 21. Luke 21. And in Luke 21, whoops, I'll bet it doesn't take that. Okay, fat fingers. Luke 21 verse 25 is where we want to start. And we read in Luke. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. Does this sound like the same language? Does he sound like John? Does he sound like the author of Genesis? Does he sound like Paul in Colossians and in Hebrews? I think we're talking the same thing here. The earth distress among the nations. Is the earth in distress? Oh, yes it is. We have distress all over. The perplexity, the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting from fear, the expectation of the things that are coming upon the world. This pandemic is a tip of the iceberg for worldwide chaos, worldwide confusion, worldwide plagues, worldwide judgment that we read about and we studied in Revelation from chapter 6 to chapters 19. Those who don't want to believe it when they find themselves in that have to admit they can go read the road map they can know what's going to happen next and they can know how long before things will end because god has given it in such order yes the people are fainting they are afraid of what's coming the powers of heaven will be shaken and what are the powers of the heavens that will be shaken i believe that refers to the sun which is going to burn and I believe it is the stars that they're going to see fall. I believe that, that when the moon turns to blood, Scripture already told them this was going to happen. They just simply need to open their eyes to it and believe in what God has said because what God says happens. Nothing that he says does not happen in the way he said it. So the signs of the, the heavens, the sun, the moon, and the stars that, that affect this earth are signs of his second coming because I need to read verse 27. I stopped short of my point. Then, when all these earthly signs and in relation to the earth, these heavenly signs, then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud. Now, he didn't come the first time in a cloud. He came and was born as a, a baby. We know of the virgin birth, and if you can't believe in the virgin birth, then you can't believe in creation either. But if you can believe in creation, you certainly can see how God could put conception in the womb of, of Miriam. Then they'll see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. This is a description of our second coming of our Messiah, our Savior, Yeshua Jesus. We read it in Revelation 19. We read it in many other places. In Thessalonians, he talks about it. Many of the books allude to it. The Gospels all tell us of his second coming. When he'll come in power, he'll come in great glory, he'll stop the battle of Armageddon, he will set up his kingdom, Revelation chapter 20. So these shakings in the, the sky, pre, pre, what's the word, they come first. They, they preclude, I don't know if that's the right word, but anyway, they come first. And when they see that, they can know the Son of Man is coming. Um, let me show you also Matthew 24 agrees with Luke. Matthew, um, Matthew, well, they both were alive at the time of Yeshua here on this earth. It would be easy for their words to be disqualified by those who were alive, and yet no one could disqualify what they were saying because they spoke truth and truth only. Matthew 24, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, when the sun and the moon and the stars shake, when all this falling out, all these things happen, these plagues that we've been talking about, the sun darkened, the moon not giving its light, the stars falling from the sky, the powers of heaven being shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. 
Again, there's a sign there. I believe that we're going to see a little more significance of what that sign is, but we'll wait till we get to that point. I'll just dangle my little carrot. You're going to want to see how this comes together in our study. Uh, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Well, did Matthew just cooperate with Luke? They both said the same thing. Different walks, different talks, different backgrounds, and they're saying the same thing. And it's showing us again. Different Re prophets. Different, yes, and the different prophets said it also. Revelation 6, let's go there. We know that Revelation 6 introduces us to what happens in the tribulation. It's just the beginning there. But we read in verses 12 through 14 of Revelation 6, uh, and this is after the six seals, that, the, well, the sixth seal is broken. Then there's a great earthquake. The sun becomes black as sackcloth made of hair. The whole moon becomes like blood. The stars of the sky fell to the earth. Does he sound like Matthew? Does he sound like Luke? He's saying the same thing. Here's a third witness. The fig tree dropping unripe figs when it's shaken by a great wind. We've all seen fruit fall off the tree before it's ready when a wind shakes it. And the fig tree being a picture of Israel, we see Israel's going to be shaken by the, the calamities that are happening. But it will be worldwide, not just Israel. Verse 14 tells us the sky was split apart like a scroll when it was rolled up. Keep those words in mind. We're going to be referring to that as we go through this study. Every mountain and island was removed from its place. The kings of the earth, the eminent people, the commanders, the wealthy, the strong, the slave, the free, they all hid themselves in the caves among the rocks. They said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us. Hide us from the sight of him who sits on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. They realize God's wrath is being poured out on this earth in these uh, happenings. And they're, instead of turning to him and asking for him to protect them, they want to hide from him. I see in the same way Adam and Eve hid in the garden from the Lord instead of facing him and saying, we need you. Okay, it's also a testimony to the gospel of Yeshua Hamashiach that shows Jesus as Messiah, as Savior. We've seen that in Psalm 19, 1, uh, 1, but let me take you through verse 4 here because we don't just stop with verse 1. Psalm 19, 1 through 4, the heavens are declaring, the heavens are telling the glory of God. They're telling Yeshua. Their expanse declares the work of his hands. We see what he did when he created. But then notice, day to day pours forth speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There's no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. They're not literally speaking, but they're shouting their story. And it tells us in verse 4, their line has gone out to all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. In them he's placed a tent for the sun. And it goes on. It talks about um, the groom coming for, for his beloved. We see, we'll see more of this as we talk about it in detail. We'll go through verse 6. But take that. Take that testimony that it's speaking about the Lord. It's declaring what is going to happen with the Lord. And we see that again with Romans 10. I, I guess even though I alluded to it, we're going to read it after all in this class too. Chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. And we see here, faith comes from hearing, hearing by the word of Messiah, the word of Christ. So again, as the stars are declaring, telling the story of Messiah, this is the voice that we are hearing also that we read about, that, that when we put our faith in it, the same way Abraham believed in what God showed him in those stars, and it was counted to him for faithfulness. It counted to him for righteousness. And uh, verse 18 tells us, I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Has everybody heard? You know, <coughs> there are so many people arguing and say, oh, no, 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 people in the jungles, they haven't heard, they don't know, it's not fair. Well, here's your answer. Their voice, the voice of the sun, signs in the heavens, have gone out into all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. God sees to it that the gospel goes all the way to the ends of the world through creation, and he's going to do it even through human uh, factor, the 144,000 during the tribulation. Everyone will hear, but even those who have not heard a voice speak it, the heavens are declaring it, and they can know it, and we've seen proof and talked about proof before <coughs> that show us that. Look at Psalm 97. Psalm 97, we're going to look at verse uh, 1, I believe, first, and then 6, I think we want, yes, verses 1 and 6. 
Verse 1 of Psalm 97, Adonai, the Lord reigns. May the earth rejoice. May the many islands be joyful. Okay, the Lord is reigning. Verse 6, the heavens declare his righteousness, the king's righteousness, this reigning one. The heavens are telling it. And all the peoples have seen his glory. How could the psalmist say all the people have seen it? If they're on the other side of the world and, and they're not hearing and not being told, they've seen it in creation. They can know it that same way also. Are we building our case well? Oh, I think we're building it very well. Let me take you to 1 John. 1 John, whoops, 1 John chapter 2. That's our little books by the same author, John, but these are the ones that come just before the book of Revelation if you're hunting for them. 1 John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. We have Yeshua, Jesus, the righteous. Okay? He's our advocate. He's standing in the gap for us. He is... He is revealing God of creation, the God we call the God the Father in heaven. He's revealing himself to us so that we can have his righteousness. Look at Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 6. We read, In his days Judah will be saved. Israel will live securely. This is by his name, which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. So what is the heavens declaring? The righteousness of our God and how we can be made righteous like Abraham was made righteous. It's not in our, in our actions. It's not that we earn it, merit it, do good works. It's not even in our knowledge. Oh, now we're smart enough. We're righteous. No, it is freely given, and it is given by believing in Yeshua Jesus in what he did, declaring his blood in our place. Now we have his sacrifice fulfilling our punishment. He came to life, we come to life in him, and we have that relationship with God the Father. It all ties together. Look at Malachi, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2. Last book in your original covenant. It's not if you pick up the Jewish Bible, it's just in a different order. But in yours, it will be the last book. Verse 2 says, but for you who fear my name, and that fear is not I'm afraid. That fear is a respect. For those who have an awe and a respect for the name, and it's God's name, not my name, but God's name. The sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you will go forth and frolic like calves from the stall. Newborn calf, new life, and they're, they're frolicking and they're dancing and they're happy. And it's saying that you can have that because the Son of Righteousness will reveal God to you. And when you're in right relationship with Him, He floods you with His joy. It's a joy that's not dependent on your circumstances. It's a joy that your circumstances can't take away from you. It is the testimony of the one who wants to clothe us in his righteous robe. And I say that on purpose because when we get into our first sign, remember that I've said that to you. He wants to clothe us in his robe of righteousness. And you'll see why that's significant in a bit. That all people will be able to see his glory, his brightness from the very beaming, the glory that, that's beaming that we read about when, when Hebrews 1, 3 tells us he's a radiant image, the radiant glory, the express image of our God. We're seeing that Shekhinah glory. We're seeing that glory that has to be camouflaged by smoke, by incense, by something. It has to be what remains behind. It can't be seen by human eyes full on. You can't even look at the sun and see the sun and not have it damage your eyes let alone the Shekinah glory of God Amen. that is revealed in all of this. What, what, what we're seeing is just amazing. But we do get a glimpse of his glory through these words, through his creation, through all that he is showing us. But we're just getting a taste of the greater. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And verse 6 says to us, 
For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Yeshua. In a actually, in the face of the Messiah. It's actually, that's the Hebrew word there, in the face of the anointed one. What is that saying to us? Light, the Lord said, I am the light of the world. It said of Israel that they sat in darkness, yet there they saw a great light. They saw the light of their Messiah. Shines out of the darkness, shines into our hearts so that we have the light of the knowledge, our knowledge. Oh, I'm so smart now. Oh, I'm a rocket scientist now. Oh, I, I've hit this level, so now I get it. Or I've worked my way up to nirvana or whatever else you want to say. No, it says that we have the knowledge of the glory of God. What's the glory of God? Yeshua. We have the knowledge of Yeshua. We see God in the face of our Messiah. That's what's being declared. His glory is seen in this way. And that's why Yochanan John 1 verse 14 can tell us, and I know it well, but I'll wait and read it so I do it right. <laughs> And when the and the word which we learned in the beginning was God is God is Yeshua Jesus who is one with God verse 14 the word became flesh dwelt among us we saw his glory glory as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth that's what's revealed in the stars when we see his glory that's what we are seeing the testimony of him as our Messiah, Him as our righteous God, he, he who puts His righteous robe on us when we believe. We even see that the stars were to be a sign of Emmanuel's birth, and I say Emmanuel because that name means God with us. And when God came to be with us in human flesh, His birth, we see this was signified by a sign. We see it by a star. Go with me to Numbers chapter 24 and verse 17. Someone said this is a Jewish study. It comes right out of our Jewish scriptures, which is what you commonly call the Old Testament um, or Old Covenant. We like to say original because we want you to realize it's not old as in antiquated. It's just that there is a new that came, promised Jeremiah the prophet. But this is very Jewish. When you get into, into Numbers, you've got the prophecies, you've got... You're, we're talking about um, Jacob at this time. You'll see what I'm saying. But it goes far. It's not. It, it's just what was given to the Jewish people because they were to represent God to the world. Remember that. So here's what said. I see him, the one we've been talking about, the Messiah, the Redeemer, the one who is God, the one who shows us the glory of God. I see him, but not now. I look at him, but not near. Okay. Abraham could say that. Oh, I see him. I get it. Because remember, the Lord said he saw my day. He saw what the Lord was going to do. That's what's being said here. I see him. I see the Lord. And it's looking forward to that first coming because we're in the time of the children of Israel with Moshe in the wilderness. We're not any further than that on our timeline of humanity. I see him, but not now. I look at him, but not near. It's going to be a long ways down that, that timeline because we're at maybe, let's just say 1400 B.C. And before Yeshua is going to be doing his ministry, it's going to be at least 1400 years. But now notice the description is given. A star shall appear from Jacob. A star is going to appear in Israel, Jacob's representative of Israel. The scepter shall rise from Israel. We know that means that this star that's going to rise is going to be king. He's going to come from the tribe of Judah. We know that. What will this one do? This one will smash the forehead of Moab and overcome all the sons of Sheth. What that's saying is this one who we see that's coming in the future will subdue all our enemies. Who are they seeing? They're seeing the glory of Messiah. They're seeing him coming in that second coming, which is another at least uh, close to 2,000 years from that first coming. So now we're looking down 3,500 years of time. Yes, it was a long way off. They didn't see him close, but they saw very clearly the star would rise. This star 
will do what I have just said. Remember the kings of the east who came to see the birth of the king? They saw his star. He has a star. We'll talk about the star he has as we go on through our study. So it was even signs for Emmanuel's birth. And by the way, just to give you the reference, you know I'm not making things up. Matthew 2.2 2 is where our kings of the east declare that. The verse 1 tells us, After Yeshua Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi, the wise men, from the east arrived in Yerushalayim, why in Jerusalem? Why did they come there? Israel's not the head nation of the world. Rome's controlling that area. Herod's a puppet king that has to do uh, Rome's will and keep it there from being an insurrection in Israel. But yet they went to the palace. They went to Jerusalem and they asked. And these are the wise men, the ones who studied the stars, the ones who had all this knowledge. And remember, I believe they got it from Daniel and it being passed down. And they say, where is he who is born king of the Jews? They knew the king of the Jews was born. We saw his star in the east. We saw his star back at home. And we have come to worship him. They knew. They saw. They followed something. And we'll get more specific as our story goes on. Our study goes on. It's not a story that sounds like fairy tale. This is truth. But we see now the signs show us the indestructibility of the Jewish people, God's faithfulness to keep his covenant. He made a promise to Israel, he keeps it. We see the signs of the stars show us the great glory and the power of our creator. We see the, the stars are going to show the testimony of the gospel, the life that Yeshua Jesus would lead. We're going to see death, burial, resurrection, all in the stars. Remember I told you 31.8 million light years out there <coughs> in a universe that, that is a sphere. We see uh, come up out of the midst of that in star shape, but we, the stars form a cross out there that far out. God planned this before the foundations of our world, before he created the sky that we see. This scroll that we're unrolling, it was there. This is showing the testimony of Yeshua, Jesus. The heavens are declaring he is righteous, and his righteousness is our robe when we come into faith in him. The signs and the stars show his first coming, they show his second coming. Again, remember Matthew 24 <coughs> said that, that or, or Luke 21, one of those two, if not both, said that, that there would be a sign in the heavens of his <coughs> coming. Could even be a star again, um, and even more, of course. Now, the lights also, so the lights were for giving light. They were for signifying something, giving signs. They were also for seasons, Genesis 1.14 told us. In case if you don't remember it, even though I read it earlier, let me reread it to you. Genesis 1, chapter uh, 1, verse 14. We read that God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate day from night, and they'll serve as signs. We looked at both of those. Now it says, And for seasons, for days and years. When it's saying it in the Hebrew, it's saying for cycles of times. And the, the Hebrew, um, the way that they, oh, come on, Michelle, what's the word? The Hebrew, um, calculation is the wrong word, but the way they, they see time still is they follow the, the lunar. They follow the moons. They recognize when it's Rosh Chodesh, the new moon. They know a new time, a new cycle of time has begun. They see 12 cycles of 30 days of the moon cycle. That's why their calendar is 30-day months. And they don't call them by names that we call them. They, they see them just simply as times. And we'll get into that more as we look at the Jewish calendar in a bit. But this is telling us in verse 14 of Genesis that, that the Hebrew meaning is for, for light, the Hebrew meaning is for signifying, for signs, and it is to show us the cycle of times. It is to show us the seasons. We have seasons. We see that regularly. Again, the orderliness of our God. What always follows spring? Summer. What always follows summer? Fall. What always follows fall? Winter. What always follows winter? Spring. It never gets mixed up. It never changes its order. It never jumps out of line. It's cycles of time. It's an orderliness. 
and the seasons are for a purpose also. We'll see that in more in our study too, but even right now, let me show you Psalm 104. Psalm 104, verse 19, we read, He made the moon for the seasons, the sun to know its place of setting. Then it goes on, you point darkness, it becomes night, etc. Okay, he made the moon for the seasons. The, the seasons, everything cycles. We know the waves with the ocean even go with the cycle of the moon. We see that orderliness that is there. It's for a fixed time, a set time, an appointed time. We see it referred to three times in Genesis in that way, so I'll take you back to Genesis. If your fingers can't move as fast as my tablet can do, don't worry, I read it to you. <laughs> Genesis 17, 21, and we read there. But I will establish my covenant with Yitzhak, with Isaac whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. Okay, what's just happened? God in the form of an angel has told Abraham and Sarah, you are going to have that baby. She's going to be pregnant. You're going to have that baby at this season next year. Well, obviously we know that there's nine months for a baby's birth, so she didn't conceive that day, but about three months she conceived. And in that season, we're going to see that Isaac came. There's an order. We know even now the, the, the season for a, a pregnant woman is nine months. It's not six months for some and a year for others. It's never off by much. In fact, <coughs> so, uh, medicine, doctors have gotten so good at it that my niece gave birth to her baby, her first one, on the very day they told her it was her due date. That amazed me because you know, often we have a little bit later, a little bit early, but... Sheila was God's a always on time. My first was a whole month late. She was supposed to come in February, and she didn't come to the 11th day of March. Okay, so we do have sometimes when we see the late, but it's still within. You don't go pregnancy for a year, and you don't go pregnancy for six months and have a developed baby. We know it's nine months. We see the seasons and the times. Genesis 17, God said, next season, at this time, at that season. Now go with me, whoops, I went back too far, go with me to Genesis 18. Just flip the chapter, the page over to Genesis 18, 14. We'll see the fulfillment. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. That's telling us, because remember, Sarah's womb was dead. His, the birth of Isaac was miraculous. It was a foreshadowing of the miraculous birth of the Messiah, but it was not virgin born. Sarah had had relations and she still had relations with Abraham. God brought back the fruit of her womb and she becomes pregnant and God says, you will have this son. I thought 18 showed us the completion, but look at 21. Chapter 21 and verse 2 will show us what God said happened. I, uh, chapter 21, verse 2, so Sarah conceived, she bore a son to Abraham in his old age. She was 90 and he was 100 at the point of time of which God had spoken to him. When was he born? In the cycle of the time, the appointed time. God gives us seasons and gives us time. So, in conclusion, Genesis 1.14 can be translated that the sun, the moon, and the stars are for signs of things to come. They're for signs of seasons, they're for signs, excuse me, of cycles, speaking to fixed times, speaking to events, speaking to specific, you know, orderliness. So that we say later, when Yeshua Jesus was born, the first coming, that he came in the fullness of time. He came in the cycle of time that God had predicted. That was when he was to be born, that's when he was born. And we see all kinds of prophecies fulfilled in where he was born, as well as when he was born. Because God keeps his word and he is faithful, and he gave it ahead. If you ever need proof to you that the Bible is alive and is the word of God, I'll tell you, look at prophecy. If you throw out everything else, look at prophecy. And when God can predict so exacting and fulfill so exacting, never miss, that should give you the faith to believe the rest of the word of God is just as true. God is faithful. We have in our new covenant references that give evidence of the gospel being preached before the word was written. 
I've showed you this before, but again, let's see it. We'll go to Jude, the little book just before Revelation. It only has one chapter, but if you're on a tablet, you've got to put in Jude 1 <laughs> to get to it. Um, computer the same way, just to help you. Verses 14 and 15, Enoch, the seventh generation from Adam. So we're talking way back. We're talking, um, okay, let's just say before 3500 B.C., is Enoch's time, prophesied, okay, uh, let me start the verse again so I give you a context, it was also about these people that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, behold, the Lord comes with many thousands of his holy ones, or of his saints, Enoch, 3500 BC, is saying, there's a day coming when the Lord's going to come back with thousands of his saints, we know that day will be fulfilled yet. It hasn't happened yet. It's coming in when, just before the millennium when he stops the battle of Armageddon. Revelation 19 tells us that he returns with his saints to set up his kingdom. But how on earth did Enoch know that? We know it because we read the Bible. We read the Word of God. We have the book of Revelation. We see it unveiled there. How did Enoch know? Did he see in the stars the same way Abraham saw the first coming? Did he see the second coming? Yes, I believe fully that that does show us that. Look with me also at Luke 1, verse 67. Luke chapter 1 and verse 67. And we read in Luke 1, 67, a long way down in that chapter. And his father, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, with the Ruch HaKodesh. He prophesied, saying, okay, so he's forth telling, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. He has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David, just as he, just as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. What's Zechariah saying? He's saying, the Holy One of Israel, the Lord God of Israel, has visited us. He was prophesying about the birth of Jesus, the one who would be the horn of salvation. He would come from the house of David, just as the prophets had said. Zechariah is telling that before he was born. Whose family did Jesus come from in his earthly flesh? The house of David. The prophecy is being told before it's being fulfilled. And Acts 3 also talks to us. We'll look at it just real quickly, verses 20 and 21. This also tells us of the, the foretelling that we see in Scripture. Acts 3, verses 20 and 21 tell us. And, of course, all the prophets, you can look at it, and they told us where he'd be born, when he would be born, who his parents would be. I mean, it goes on and on. Um, so many prophecies, and yet for one person to fulfill just eight prophecies is 10 to the 17th power and then some. Just to fulfill eight, and he fulfilled over 300 prophecies in his first coming alone. Acts chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 says, And that he may send Yeshua the Messiah appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. What's the author of Acts saying? That the Lord Jesus, the one that, that you have seen, the one that was appointed to be here at his first coming, that this one, heaven's going to receive him. We know he went back into heaven, he is waiting in heaven, and that there will be a restoration of all things, as the prophets have said, he's talking about the second coming. Even, even he goes on and he quotes in verse 22. Moshe said, Moses said, The Lord God will raise up a prophet like me from your countrymen. If you look at Moses' life and you look at Yeshua's life, you see such a comparison. I have done a whole message. I can take an hour and a half on that one line alone and show you the prophet Moshe and the prophet Yeshua. You will see the comparison. Moshe was good. Yeshua was better. And it goes all the way through point after point after point after point. And this is what's being said. Moses said, there's one who's coming greater than me from our countrymen. That means from the, the, the Jewish genealogical line. To him you shall listen regarding everything he says to you. It shall be that every soul that does not listen 
to that prophet, to the one who comes from God, shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And we know those who choose not to believe that their end is destruction that God gives them the, the chance to believe. He wants them to believe, but when they choose not to believe, then it's on them. What can God do? He put it in creation. He put it in the written word. He's given it out by many prophets, spoken in many ways through many times. It has come down to this day. We are still telling it. We are forth telling what comes in the future. We are also telling what has happened in the past showing the exactness of our God, the faithfulness to every word, nothing has failed, and if they yet choose to not believe, then they end up in that eternal separation from the God who created them, who wanted that <coughs> relationship with them, and they are the ones who refused it. So, for more than a, over 2,000 years, before Moshe is, is writing down what we have written, he's actually compiling and putting together, but what we have written, that when you pick up your Bibles and you read the first five books in your Bible, we're talking 2,500 years before that was the written word. We can see the knowledge of God's program. We can see everything people needed to know for salvation, to believe, to have faith, and to know what to have faith in. We see it preached from Enoch, we see it all the way through to the end. We see that it, it was told and told and told in so many ways. God is awesome. God is amazing, and he is not willing that any should perish. So he's put it out there time and again and given it to us in all directions. So a scientist can look at it. An archaeologist can look at it. A mathematician can look at it. A dummy like me can look at it. <laughs> Whatever your background, the fisherman, the, the, you know, I don't care what walk of life you're in, you can look at the Word of God and see the exactness, the truth of it, and those who were there before the Word of God had the same option to see, to know, and to believe. God is so faithful and so not willing that any should perish. God gives us reference to this stellar revelation of His, he gives the names to the, these. We're going to see he named the stars. We're going to see the names of planets given in our scriptures. Why did God name them? Well, you're thinking of an answer to that, and I'll give you mine. Look with me at Psalm 147 and verse 4, because again, I don't want you to think this is my thought or my idea. This is what God has taught us in his word. Psalm 147, verse 4, it says he counts the number of the stars. Now we've already seen how count means far more than one, two, three. <laughs> we've seen how it's narrating, it's telling, it's declaring. But notice the next line of Psalm 147 and verse 4. He gives names to all of them. When we get into this study, I'm going to tell you that their stars give you their names from the Hebrew, from the Arabic, from original languages and what they mean and it will blow your mind. So while you're thinking of that and still coming up with the reason why did God name them, let's look at one other proof, and that's Yeshia, Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, we're going to look at verse 26, and here we have written for us, so now we've got our two authors, our two witnesses again. Verse 26 says, whoops, <laughs> it says, raise your eyes on a high, see who has created these stars, look up. Look at the stars, see who's created them. The one who brings out their multitude by number. He brings them out thousands at a time. When we see a space of sky at night with no lights or pollution to keep us from seeing, it's so dotted, oh my goodness, it's like a little freckled face. There's so many dots, so many freckles, you can't count them. God has a multitude of stars. And then notice again, he calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might the strength of his power not one of them is missing i love that you ever done a thousand piece puzzle and you're getting down to the end and you've got a piece missing and your picture can't be complete isn't that frustrating <laughs> you want so it's, your so a star finish. it's just a light it's not an angel or anything. it's not an angel it's a, st it's it's a, a star it's a it's a it's a Yes, it gives off light. It's not a planet. It's a star planet. It's a big stars in a way. Um, but it's an actual, um, it's made up of matter. 
but it's not an angel, no. We, when we say that we shine like the stars, we're not really stars, but when we're shining, we're showing the glory of the Lord, we're shining. <coughs> the angels shine for the Lord. They show the Lord, but, but angels are not stars, and stars are not angels. They are separate, so they're, they're created. A, a light, a, a mass of light. Yeah, okay, a mass of light. Kind of boils it down simply, but we'll accept that. I could give you a scientific definition, but that about does it on our level, okay? So we see he's got them all named. He's got a name for purpose. He's got a complete picture. There's not one thing missing in his picture. You can connect the dots. You ever done one, two, three, four, and you see the picture as you connect them? That's what we're doing in the Gospel of the Stars. We're connecting the dots. We're connecting the stars, and the whole picture is going to be the life of our Lord. We're going to see his first coming. We're going to see that we are his people. We're going to see his second coming. We see the whole plan as salvation given in the stars. It's fascinating. And I bring you back to that question, why did God name them? Remember if I take you to um, Adam? Adam's been created. This is before he has Eve. God's created all the animals before he created Adam. We're told that. Read Genesis 1. We'll get there one day. <laughs> but on the sixth day, God created the animals, and then he creates, we'll call it the crown and glory. He creates the human. He makes Adam. He brings all the animals out to Adam. He says, name them. Have fun. And, and, of course, I only know them in English. I know a few. I can tell you dog in Hebrew is Kelef. So he's, he's a dog wolf, wolf, and he says, oh, I'll call you Kelef. <coughs> he calls them all by different names. He, he had a great mind to be able to think up different names. I mean, how many of us could name ten kids, you know, let alone <laughs> ten different animals, hundred different animals? He let Adam name them all. He let him have fun. He let him enjoy. And those names stood. They stand all the way down through time. But God chose to name the stars. Why? I believe because God speaks prophetically through his stars. Those names have meaning. And he had to give them because he was the one who knew the story they were to tell. He's writing the story. He's the author, so of course he's going to name his stars so that they tell his story. Adam couldn't tell his story, so Adam couldn't look up and say, well, I'll call that star and give a name. No, but he could be taught that God calls it this. And I believe even Abraham saw and was told names of stars that told the story. Rowena, is that a question? Uh, no, I just wanted to... Uh... There's a verse in the Bible that says uh, the different creations of God, the different forms of bodies. So it just like dawned on me that if God, the fish has a different kind of body and God commanded the fish to get and eat, uh, I mean, swallow up Jonah. So right here when you were mentioning in Isaiah 40, that the one who leads them forth, the host by numbers, is just like he's able to order this bodies, a different kind of body which we see as the stars, Yes. and they obey Him. Yes, yes, and just like we as humans speak and foretell, the stars have a language. The sky has a language. That's what Psalm 19 is telling us. When there's speech uttered in the day, and at night there's language, that's their speech, that's their voice, that's how they're uttering. It's just different words than us, but we learn to understand those words. We're learning a new language. We're learning the language of the stars. Yeah. Just like each, each Hebrew name means a certain thing. Yes, that each cool. Hebrew name does mean a certain thing. We even see, we bring that down into our lives today. If you follow in, in Orthodox Judaism, a child's given a name at birth, written on the birth certificate, but they're given a Hebrew name also. And at their bar mitzvah, they're confirmed with that Hebrew name or bat mitzvah for those who are <coughs> down from the Orthodox. But, but names are significant, and names have a meaning. When... Uh, Pastor Gil was, was in L.A., and he's just began to really discover the Jewish roots that he has. And he mixed in an area where they had some of the Orthodox. These are the extreme Orthodox. Their intent is to bring everybody back to Judaism. So they're trying to rope in everyone they can at this Jewish festival. And so they asked him if he had laid to film, is what they call it. If he would put on... What you put, they put on the arm and on the head, you know. And if he 
um, had, you know, done that that day and said the prayers. And of course he hadn't, so he told me he hadn't. So they said, oh, we'll help you. So they wrap him up in, in saying it and doing it. And there's nothing wrong with that because what is being said comes right out of Deuteronomy. That you're to put the, the word of God in your mind. You're to put it into your heart. So he has no problem going along with it. But they asked him, do you have a Hebrew name? And he said no, because to his knowledge, he was not given a Hebrew name. So the rabbi says, okay, I will give you a Hebrew name. And he thought, and he said, you seem like a Sha'ol to me. He gave him the Hebrew name Saul, which, of course, you can look at it one of two ways. You can look at Saul, the first king of Israel, who started out good with God in the initial part of his kingdom, but very quickly went from prophesying for God to being not a good representation of God at all. Or you can look at the one called Sha'ol, who we read about in our New Covenant, who went from, didn't lose his Jewishness, but went from Judaism, Pharisee of the Pharisees, into what we call Judeo-Christianity today. He embraced the belief of who his Messiah and Savior was, Yeshua, Jesus. And of course, that's where Pastor Gill's heart just leapt because he would love to emulate Sha'ol Paul as Paul emulates Messiah. So he felt like he was given the perfect name to be one who tells the others like Sha'ol Paul does. <clears throat> Hebrew names are significant. They have a meaning. The names that God gave the stars, they have a meaning. Let me show you that we know some so of these things. Let me get this straight. <laughs> okay. They, the stars communicated with each other like a person in their own language? Did the stars communicate with other stars? I don't know. I don't know if they have that personality that way, but their names certainly do. Hey, Lolo, Lolo, Lolo. Huh? Hey, Lolo, Lolo. <laughs> I think we have a whole other language coming up right now. <laughs> um, I can't tell you. I'm not going to limit God's creation, but I'm not going to tell you that, that I know that they spoke. But we do know, we learn, we learn that the dolphins communicate with the sounds that they make in the waters, you know, and man has learned to interpret some of that, and they've learned to understand some of man's language. What was it like before the fall broke our communications? I don't know, but, but at least they tell the story, whether they spoke to each other or not. I kind of tend to think, as it talks about the stars singing and the stars dancing, I kind of tend to think you may be on to something there. Yep. Yeah. We still see them twinkling in the sky, so. <laughs> They're still twinkling, yes. <laughs> it is a mind blower. Rowena? You know, this lesson is like renewing my mind, because I remember as a child, we were taught in science, living things and non-living things. And non-living things are not able to move. Right. And we classify the heavenly bodies, the stars, the, we classify them as non-living things. That's why there's like a, a certain block that happens when you're teaching about these stars narrating the story because in my old mind, these are non-living things, but there is a certain kind of life that God gives them so they're able to obey God. Right, so. right, right. And it, I, your key way of saying that, a certain kind of life. They don't have the same kind of life as us. They're not human and they're not angels. But there is a life source there. They are alive. They, they die out. You know, our, like, when we see a star burn out. Like the they do living. move, you the know. They, Earth's a living planet, so. The Earth is a living planet. Yeah. Here, it, yeah. This is again. <laughs> let your mind go and see where you end up because we don't fully understand. Naomi, you're muted. Unmute yourself. Hello. Can't okay. unmute still. Keep trying. You're still <laughs> muted. Some can unmute there easily. Oh, there we are. Okay. Now? Yes. <laughs> now. For some reason, it's all switched from, I think, today. But anyway, um, he said even the rocks, Jesus, when he... Good point. Him, He said even the rocks would, would cry, cry out. out. Yes. So I think, he, you know, through his power, yes. anything and everything that was created, he has given it a power... Yes. And at his command, it's going to do whatever he, you know, yes. wants it to do. Yes. And let well, me... I think, and it, the, the, I think the main thing is that 
it will be done in a manner that will glorify him yes and that no one will doubt that the power is him not the rock has the power but he will give it that ability right. to do it right and let me just tell you in my little understanding of science we are told the wall is not solid it looks solid but the new neurons and the protons and electrons are all moving at vast speeds to give us this solid appearance and that mm -hmm. if we could move fast enough we could separate those to go through the walls without disturbing the wall which tells me we're caught up in the twinkling of an eye that's the scientific explanation of the miraculous work of our god but she is so right on target here that the rocks would even cry out. And when he said that, I think he even pointed to the rocks making the temple. And don't we say the walls have ears? Don't we say that, that if you live in your house long enough, the, the parents that have raised children and grandchildren, they can sit there at night, total quiet, and hear the walls talk, the stories they could tell. Don't we say that? We see the trees of the field will clap their hands. They're going to rejoice. They're going to sing and dance. I think all of creation is going to come alive in a way we have not seen and fully understood. And I think even now, when it says that creation groans because it's under that curse also. They've lost ability that was theirs due to the curse of sin take that and remove it see that the in the stars before the curse comes in and we begin to see far more alive than what we were thinking originally this the the hills are alive with the sound of music the stars are alive with the, with the sound of god's gospel they are dancing and the, the stars dance you know that they, they respond to their creator in in a way that we don't know how to put it because we haven't been out there we're not out there we're too confined in our mind but i think you're well on the path to opening your minds up to seeing wow and in that creation every aspect of creation it, there's a purpose for it there's a reason there's a relation and that's what god is showing us and he could reveal to Abraham, he could reveal through the time, the story that the stars are telling. And that's exciting. I can only imagine as God was pointing out to Abraham, his heart must have just a dum da dum da dum, dum, you know, getting so excited over seeing. And then probably to be, to be crushed at that moment that he sees the crucifixion, only to rejoice when he sees the resurrection. You know, wow. Wow. Yeah. I wonder if heaven will have all these things uh, communicate and we're viewing all this. I heaven. absolutely believe heaven will. Why would it have less? I think it'll I think we're on the ground floor like a, a oh. preschooler trying to understand the college, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that it absolutely we will see how creation reflects the glory of our God. We'll see how it is rejoicing it's responding yes absolutely that and far more that's why mm -hmm. you know as we go out and explore and as we've talked about um, people literally being put on these planets in time and, and rejoicing those planets already rejoicing in their god yes now remember it's human life that the curse comes on that separates man from god and we see god enter into our world in human flesh to save us we don't see that for the, the other, we don't see it even for the angels. God did not come up with a redemption plan for the angels who turned their back on God, but he does for us. We are the crowning glory of that creation, and he enters into that relationship with us. That's unique, and that's one of a kind. I don't believe the Lord's out there dying for every, you know, for the stars and the rocks and all that, but they're declaring his story. They're telling his story. I saw a hand. I don't remember whose. Anne, sorry. <laughs> Go yes, ahead. Um, I just wanted to mention that, that you talked about uh, atoms and, and uh, protons and neutrons, electrons. Science, as, as you know, has taken it, the atom, to much, much smaller elements um, beyond, beyond the proton, neutron, and electron smaller and smaller and smaller until they have finally reached 
what uh, they can only refer to as the God element mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it is pure energy. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of, um, is it uh, Colossians? Colossians, where it, it's referred to as um, that by him all things consist. Mm -hmm. And also, it, that reminds me of the two gentlemen who are responsible for the creation of the bomb, the hydrogen bomb. And one of them was speaking and he said, the miracle isn't that we can split the atom, the miracle is that it stays together in the first place. Right. Because right. it's just pure energy. Right. right. So they get back actually to a think of that, source. it's like everything that surrounds us is a declaration of the Lord. Exactly. That's and, what we're saying. And there is a life source and that yeah. source cannot be produced in the test tube, in the laboratory, or in man's mind. It can only be produced by God, the one true and living God. Right. Yeah. Amen. Good point, Anne. Good point. Okay, let's look real quickly. I'd like to be able to get through our introduction and get us into the, the first um, picture next week, but, I mean, set up ready for it. So let's just look real quickly and see... Um, <coughs> Let me take you to to, oh, to Job, because Job is um, at least 2000, if not 2100 BC. He's all the way back. He's a contemporary with Avraham. And we're going to see that he knew about constellations and he knew about their names. So let's see what he says in his book. Go with me to Job chapter 9, verses 8 and 9. Some of this, if you have translations that are later, they may have different words. I'll try to cover as many of the words as I can, but you'll probably be able to fill in with whatever word your translation has given you. Chapter um, 9, verse 8. Who alone stretches out the heavens? That's our God. We know it. He tramples down the waves of the sea. Who makes the bear? Okay, the bear, we know um, the, the great bear is Ursa Major for us today. Arcturus is a name that's given scientifically to the bear. Orion, that's the great hunter, still called Orion today. And the Pleiades. The Pleiades are the seven stars that we're going to see in Taurus when we talk about Taurus. And the constellations of the south. So here Job knew about um, the, the great bear, Ursa Major. He knew about Orion. He knew about the Pleiades. He knew about um, the, that there are constellations in the south. And I'll tip my hand right now. That means that he knew about Scorpio because Scorpio is the most southern opposite directly is Taurus, the most northern, because we're going to look at the elliptical path of the sun, this zodiac path through, um, as it goes through, I'll, I'll say it better. When I get to that point in my notes, I'll say it better, but we're going to see that these constellations are in that, as the sun goes through, as the moon goes through each of its cycle. Look at chapter 38 of Job. Chapter 38 Verses 31 and 32, <coughs> excuse me, and I do have to explain what the word means, but what we get from the root when we go back into what the Hebrew means. In chapter uh, 38, verse 31, it says, can you tie up the chains of the Pleiades? You may have cords, you may have cluster, you could even have the words influences or luxuries. All of these are words that have been given, but the idea is that there is there's something that ties these stars together. There, there's a relation of these stars in the Pleiades or the courts of Orion, and we know that they see that today. They see the, the connection so that they call out, this is Orion, this is Pleiades. You know, they, they can tell these different names. For us, I, I simply bring it down to when you see the Big Dipper, you know, the seven stars that are connected for the Big Dipper, okay? We know there's a connection. That's what this is saying. Verse 32 also says, can you bring out a constellation in its season? See, the constellations have their seasons. They have their cycles of time. And there's also from the Hebrew, the word, um, sometimes it's translated the Maseroth. That's the pathway again. But it, it gives in the Hebrew the idea that there's divisions, that there's something that ties up and loses. So there's something that, that we're seeing again, what I believe is those cycles. We're seeing the 12 divisions. We're seeing 12 different cycles. So 
we see Scorpio when we're supposed to see Scorpio. We see Taurus when we're supposed to see Taurus. Because remember, the stars are moving. The sky changes. The stars that you look up and see tonight are not the stars you'll see three months from tonight. We can't tell the difference because of where we live. But for those who can do the study and see, they know what has moved because the sky, the stars do move. 32, I think, also says, um, well, it, it doesn't there, but the idea given is that it's in season, it's in the point of times. Look at this one. This one, Job 26, and when we get into our constellations and we look at them and the, um, the pictures that they all draw for us, this will mean even more then. It'll blow you away, but I'll give you a start. Um, Job, 30, sorry, Job 26, verse 13. By his breath, speaking of God, by his breath the heavens are cleared. His hand has pierced the fleeing serpent. You may have the crooked serpent. This could be a reference to Hydra, or it could be a reference to Draco. I'll explain and show you who they are in the future. But it's very interesting because what we also see that in this, in the Hebrew, it, when it's saying by his breath the heavens are cleared, Garnished is a word I've used today. It comes from the Hebrew, but the idea is that there's something, you know how you put garnish on your dinner? You add that little bit of parsley or something to, to beautify the picture, to give it another depth, another color, another detail. That's the idea here, is by his breath, he is adding this detail to the heavens to what it's showing. He has split them by his breath, by his spirit. He has put them into this order. And when you see you will see a sign, one that we know is speaking to us of the dual nature of God, God-man at the same time, we will see that he pierces the serpent. And here we've got his hands pierce the fleeing serpent. So I'll, point, I'll paint all that to, for you as we go into it. And also, if it is crooked serpent in your um, translation, if it's not, that's okay. But if you see that, you may have flowing serpent. There's different words that are given. But when we see the, the path of the zodiac, very often when you see its entirety, you see it's like a circle. It's not round, it's more oval, but you see it's circular. And the ancient paintings of the zodiac, of that, that pathway that we're going to be looking at, <coughs> they saw that it formed a serpent that was bent like in a circle so that it had its tail in its mouth. You ever seen a dog chase his tail and he finally yeah. catches his tail? <laughs> okay, like that idea. That could be what's being referred to here, that crooked serpent, that flowing serpent, because we see it, and we're going to see what happens to that serpent. You already know, but we're going to see it in the Gospel of the Stars. It is amazing. Constellations were named. Isaiah, Yeshia chapter 13, names a constellation. Isaiah 13 and verse 10. You know, I don't know if it or just names constellations. I think it just names them. Uh, yeah, Isaiah 13, 10, for the stars of heaven and their constellations. We'll get the names later, okay? But it, constellations, the planets are constellations from the Hebrew. We're seeing it, 2 Kings 23, 5. I just want you to see that the idea that there are constellations is not man-made. That idea comes to us from God. God tells us they're stars. They make constellations up. Because uh, what's a constellation is a group of stars, that are in relation to each other. Uh, 2 Kings 23 and verse 5. Then he did away with the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had appointed to burn incense on the high places in the cities of Judah, surrounding the area of Jerusalem, as well as to those who burn incense to Baal. They burn incense to the sun, to the moon, to the constellations, and to the remaining heavenly lights. So see, they knew even back here in the days of the kings, they knew that there were constellations, the same that there's a sun and there's moon, and other heavenly lights would be our stars. So we see these are names. The constellation in Amos, Amos chapter 5 and verse 8 is Pleiades. Um, I think we saw that also in um, Job, but I'm trying to give you more than one witness. Amos chapter 5 verse 8, we read, He who made the Pleiades and Orion. Okay, they're named there. Um, changes deep darkness into morning. We know who that is. It's a description. You go on with the verse that is of God. We already looked at Job 26, 13, telling us God garnished the heavens, that he put 
Yeah, that was a good idea to show, to show it in groups, to show it for signs, to show it, you know, to, to be able to tell the story. But how did it get there? God breathed out. God, by his spirit, by his breath, this all came to be. Notice what Job knew. Remember, he's 2000 at least BC, okay? And go with me back to Job 26. I forgot I would have told you to keep a finger there, but we're going to just go to verse 7. Look what he knew in his day. He's referring to God. He says, he stretches out the north over the empty space, and he hangs the earth on nothing. Is that what man used to think about our earth? We know now it hangs in space. But remember what we used to be told? We used to be told by some that earth sat on the back of an elephant. They believed that for centuries, that the elephant held up the earth. And we see other, when we get into mythology, we see Hercules holding up the earth. You see, yeah, you see. But, so it's more of a cartoon thing. <coughs> well, think? the fact that those are, yeah, God told us, told Job all the way back in the beginning, because Job's one of our earliest, that the earth was hanging on nothing. Job spoke the truth. He didn't say it was on the back of Hercules or, you know, no, no. And look at Isaiah. What did Isaiah know ahead of time? And while you're looking up Isaiah chapter 40, let me also tell you, Columbus wasn't afraid to sail, even though in his day they were telling him he'd fall off the face of the earth because they thought it was, you know, square. There were, he'd go out so far and drop off. He knew about the circumference. He knew about the circular because Isaiah tells us about the circumference of the earth and his mappers, those who helped him plan his voyage, just happened to be Jewish. Do you think they just happened to know their prophet's scriptures and knew from the scriptures that the earth was not <coughs> square where they fall off the end? There's a whole lot behind the scenes that prove to us Columbus's Jewish roots. Let that one blow your mind, and another time I'll tell you about that. Okay, Isaiah 40 and verse 22, what did Isaiah know? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. God sits above the circle of the earth. He called it a circle. He didn't call it a square. He didn't call it flat. He didn't call it a rectangle. He called it a circle. He who sits above the circle of the earth is in heaven and are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He inhabits his creation, remember? And remember how he wants to tabernacle even right down to us? And we're going to see that the sun moves like through the tabernacle. We talked about that, that, that it has its path, its home, its tent. All of this we can see. When it says the heavens are stretched out like a curtain, I see when you go to a, a show, I see the curtains being opened and the drama, the story is told, the show is told. That's what I see. God's got his heavens like a curtain. He opens up that curtain and says, look at these stars. Now look at these, Act 2, Act 3, Act 4. And he goes and he tells us the whole story. I love it. I love God's description. All the way back, again, you give science long enough, they prove the Bible true. Science and the Bible get along. They're not enemies. They're not against each other. You give them time, and they prove it time and time and time again. So, Michelle, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. May I please have the reference that was just before Isaiah 40, 22? Job 26 and verse 7, that God hung the, the earth on nothing. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so in Job's time, they knew clearly about constellations, um, they knew, um, you know, this is the time of the patriarchs before Israel was formed as a nation. They had this understanding. How did Job know before the written word? It has to be that God revealed it to them through the stars. Job in chapter 19, I hope you're still, well, we're in Isaiah, but anyway, I can get there fast for you. Job 19 tells us also, remember how Enoch knew of the coming day? Uh, the Lord with his ten thousands of saints that we know is his second coming. In Job chapter 19 and verse 25, look what he knew about. He said, yet as for me, okay, and remember he's suffering, and he's, he's declaring how miserable his life is. But he says in verse 25, yet as for me, I know my Redeemer lives. 
Even though Jesus had not yet come to earth to be the Redeemer, he knew because he saw, I believe, the gospel in the stars. I know my Redeemer lives. And at the last, in, in the last days, in other words, he will take his stand on the earth. How did Job know that the one who's going to redeem the world by his shed blood would be the same one who would come and stand on this earth? declaring who he is. How did he know that? I believe he saw the gospel in the stars. Even verse 26, after my skin is destroyed, when I when this has, has become corrupted, has um, decayed, even when my skin is decayed or been destroyed, yet from my flesh I will see God, whom I on my part shall behold for myself who my eyes will see and not another. My heart faints within me. I can hardly contain it. He's saying he knew because his Redeemer lives, he knew he was going to live and see his Redeemer. He knew he would see it in who he was. Not that he was going to see it in his earthly days, but his soul that lives on, that, that what it makes the real us. This shell, we peel out of it when we leave this earth. The shell is not who we are. We are our soul, our spirit. That's who we are. And he is saying, I will see God. But he's saying, I'll see God in my flesh. How is he seeing that? Because God says he takes our flesh. He turns it from mortal to immortal. When we have gone through that, that change, which we don't do here on earth. We do that when we leave this earth. We know when we're caught up in rapture, it says that, that immediately we become immortal. We're able to live forever. We know that it says the dead in Christ will rise first. Remember, their spirit comes back to that body that somehow is redesigned. That's the wrong word. Re, it, it comes back. Recreated. Re, yeah, basically. <laughs> only not in its mortal form, now in an immortal form that will not decay, that will not die again. Job saw and knew and understood all this. God had been talking with Job, and if God talked with Abraham and showed Abraham all this, wouldn't you think that's what he's been showing and telling Job? And wouldn't you believe that's how Job saw it? Because he had knowledge he shouldn't have had. How did he get it? I believe God gave it to him. He had knowledge, we read in his book, of salvation, of God, of man, how man can become righteous. He knew so much, and this is way back, Abraham's day. How did he know it all? I believe God gave it to him. Okay, so real quickly, because I don't want to run out of time today, the history of the zodiac, and zodiac simply means circle. It's that path, that elliptical path. We see it in ancient Persian and Arabian traditions. It ascribes it to Adam and to Seth and to Enoch. It says that that's where that, that they knew about the Zodiac in their day. Um, they say that the names were preserved by Arab astronomy, not astrology. The names that were given are before the flood, before the time that Noah lived and the flood on this earth. They knew names of the stars and um, those names are what are passed down through um, time to us. When I will give you, here's the ancient Arab name, here, Arabic name, here's the ancient Hebrew name. This is what I'm talking about. They had these names all the way back then. They say that from archaeology, they find them all the way back to the time of Nimrod. That's the time of the Tower of Babel when we know that they were worshiping the stars. So they, they were, you know, aware. They had knowledge of the zodiac. They had knowledge of the path <coughs> of the sun. They had knowledge of the cycles of the moon. They had knowledge of the stars all the way back. In Acadia, we see starts in um, Nimrod's day. That's the early, early Babylonian time. We see it for the area called Iraq today. We see it for an area that is known as Egypt today. Um, even the African continent, we see that all the way back in their uh, cuneiform, in their hieroglyphics, in their uh, whatever way they found to communicate and pass down, we see it goes all the way back then. In other words, this is not a recent study. This is not something that somebody came up with in the 19th century. They show proof of the astronomy and the study of it all the way back in time. Josephus, who was a Roman Jewish historian for the Roman world, um, Yeshua's time, and well, a little past his time, he corroborated 
that there were eight ancient Gentile authorities, not the Jewish scriptures passed down, but outside of the what we call the Bible today. Those works are lost to us now, but Josephus acknowledged eight of them gave reference to the astronomy that we're going to, to look at. And again, in those, they, they have, um, said it was from the time of Adam, from the time of Seth, from the time of Enoch. They were even, it's told by Josephus, I have no way of proving this because it's lost today, but Josephus declared that they were so concerned that the revelation of the second coming of Christ not be lost, that they made two pillars. They made one out of brick, they made another out of stone, and they described the whole plan in the, the brick and in the stone. They carved it or whatever they did, and all of this that would then was the prediction of the stars, of what the stars were telling, that they did that so that it would be preserved and it could be passed down. Now, we don't have those, that pillar of brick and the pillar of stone today. What we have, like I say, is we see some of the astrological studies that were false studies off of the truth, you know, like at the Tower of Babel, what was discovered and that sort of thing. But it's interesting that Josephus declares that they said they put it down so that people would know all the way to the second coming of Christ. Interesting, they felt it was important for people to know. Origen lived in the second century AD. He asserted the book of Enoch, which is quoted in the book of Jude in our Bible, that the constellations were already named in Enoch's day. They were already divided in Enoch's day. We find conclusive proof of what we call the zodiac, those signs, you know, not the false study, but the signs. We find the Romans with them in 752 BC. We find the Greeks had um, the form of them in 787 BC. We find it in the Egyptian form as far back as 2780 BC. And then we find it in the Oriental, which takes in the Chaldean, the Babylonian, the Akkadian, all of that over 3,400 BC. Adam, they believe, was about 4,000 BC. So what we're saying is almost all the way back to Adam's very day, there is these proofs that there was this study, there was this knowledge of what, what Satan took and counterfeited to be astrology today. But that means that the truth was there first because all he can do is pervert the truth. He doesn't create the truth. He perverts the truth. And someone who did their homework, and I, I cannot prove this, but they said that they were able to take Daniel's 70 weeks, go with the timing that we get out of that, and they reckoned that they could carry this back all the way back to Adam's day. I can't prove that, but keep in mind, the earth is older than Adam. Adam came onto the recreation of the earth, literally. We'll see that when we study Genesis again. We're going to see that there was a kingdom on this what we call earth before Adam, that something took place before he was there. The earth is ancient. The earth isn't just as old as man. The earth is more ancient than man, and we even see that in science today. Now, notice also the names of the days of the week. These go back to the seven planets of the ancient nations. Sunday was the sun day. Monday was the moon day. Tuesday was called Toons Day, and it's the Anglo-Saxon way of saying Mars. So on Tuesday, they were worshiping Mars. On Wednesday, it was Wooden's Day, and that was for this, the planet called Mercury. Thor's Day was Thursday. Thor's Day is, is worshiping Jupiter. Frigga, or Freya's Day, is our Friday, and that came down to be the worship of Venus. And Saturday was Saturn Day. Yeah. That's how these names okay. of our days of the week are. I was just going to say that. <laughs> now, when you notice that God gave the Hebrews a different way, they still to this day don't call it Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. They know that and can refer to that to us. But in the, the Hebrew way of thinking, it's day one, two, three. Remember what God said in Genesis? And the evening and the morning were the first day, the evening and the morning were the second day, and that's still their reasoning, I believe it's because God kept them away from the astrology, he wanted them not worshipping the planets, he wanted them worshipping the God who created the first day, 
the God who created the second day, and he wanted them always remembering that, so he taught them in that way. We have so the Saturn God, they worship the Saturn God on, on Saturday. Saturdays. On Saturday, yeah. so when they throw it in your face, oh, you don't shouldn't worship Sundays because that was the day they worshiped the sun god. You can always come back and say, well, the evil man also worships. Right, you shouldn't on worship the on the Saturday day. either, then because that was the Saturn Your god. Saturday it's a matter god. of who you are worshiping on that day. Those who are believers in the God of creation through Yeshua Jesus, his son, are not going into church and worshiping the S U N, they're worshiping the S O N the Son of God, the one true and living God, who together in deity um, created the heavens and the earth. Um, we find alphabetic writing as far back as the time of, of, Adam, of Adam. The book of Enoch proves that, that Adam was alive 300 years after Enoch was born. We tend to categorize, here's Adam, here's Enoch. We don't realize Adam was still alive Enoch was 300 years old when Adam finally dies. So when you realize that they overwrap each other, what Enoch knew, Adam could easily have known, and vice versa. Okay, and it's interesting that the alphabetic evidence, the knowledge, the actual record of the seven planets that are in connection with the zodiac go back through all of these, that, that they all had their own alphabets, that they had the same number of letters, they had the same seven vowels in different forms, it just shows that there was a connection. What I'm showing you is even though um, we have different beliefs in different countries and different eras and different times, the zodiac was all similarly divided and it seems to have a common model. So if we, get, uh, if we see it in Egyptian hieroglyphics, if we see it in Babylonian, whatever, you know, cuneiform or whatever, there's similarities. It shows a common denominator. I take you back to the Tower of Babel. There's a common denominator. And then God scattered them, but they took what they had, they took it with them. Instead of turning away from it, they still took it with them. The Greek word um, from the ancient Hebrew for zodiac also means a way, a path, a journey. So when we see that, and then we remember, in, I read to you Numbers 24, 17, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not yet. There shall come. That's where we get that Hebrew word that gives us there's a way that he's coming. There's a path that he's coming, a star out of Jacob. So that star that's supposed to rise out of Jacob wasn't there when, when um, it was being written. It was looking toward when it would be. Um, it's a path. It's a journey. We see that. And that's why the, the wise men knew when to come because the star rose. The star shine. We'll see that. We'll get into more of that. I'm just giving you highlights on it. Um, uh, okay, when we talk about different signs, like the hunter, and we see it look like, you know, a hunter, and we, we'll say this one looks like um, the scales, and this one looks like, you know, a, a woman, the virgin. Um, those figures, those pictures are arbitrary. It's not that God says that this is exactly what they look like and you have to see it that way. There are little bits of differences, um, but it was their way of passing it down, of putting a handle on it. It's when we help our children understand something, we give them a picture to understand, to relate it to. So that it helps us. So you don't literally see you know, that design. Someone else could draw a different design that, that includes those stars in that constellation. But everybody seemed to have the same from that common denominator that was taken out. And that's what we look at and see. And in it, we see that picture. Um, we are going to see that the division of the zodiac could be referred to as a scroll. It's the scroll of heaven. It's a book that's going to be unrolled. We're going to read the scroll. We're going to see it's divided into three books. Those three books are going to have four chapters. The chapters are signs, because remember that these are signs. Each chapter is going to have three sections or constellations, and they're called decons. So you're going to have the major sign, and you're going to have three constellations that are under each. And you're going to have this in book one, and you're going to have it in book two, and you're going to have it in book three. Again, if I'm confusing you, no worries. We'll be breaking this down. I'm just giving you that broad overview, painting the big brush, and I'm hurrying because it's 344. <laughs> okay? Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to tie it up real quick with just a couple more things to say, done in a minute. 
Book one, we will see, speaks of the Redeemer in his first coming. Book two, we will see, speaks of the redeemed. And book three, we will see the Redeemer in his second coming. So there's an orderliness to it that tells the story. We see the first coming, we see the second coming, we see who he came for. Um, but it's interesting that each book that gives its peculiar <coughs> aspect of the coming one will show in it the promise of his coming. You'll see the destruction of the enemy also. You'll see the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. In other words, you never see Satan victorious in any one alone. You'll always see the complete picture where he is put down. I like that. <laughs> His end is told again and again and again and again. Mm -hmm. The heavens do form a never-ending circle. Where do we start? If it's a circle, where do we have our beginning? Where do we have our ending? Well, the logical place to start is to start with the sign called Virgo because that's the virgin. The virgin we know is in relation to the first coming. And if it's the book about the one who comes in his first coming to redeem, and we finally see it end in his second coming of, um, of glorification, then it makes sense to start with Virgo. Does that fit? Well, if you start with Virgo, your last one at the end is Leo. Leo is the lion. The lion is the majestic one, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lion who is roaring, the lion, you know, we have... Um, we have the, the birth of the child, but we have he is the king of Judah. We have him in that. And what's further is look at the Sphinx. Everyone says, well, the Sphinx is a puzzle. Why is it what it is? Do you know what makes up the Sphinx? The stick. Sphinx in Egypt. S-P-H-I-N-X. It's Everybody who, who travels to Egypt goes to see the Sphinx. It's one of the wonders of the world, okay? The Sphinx has a head of a woman. It has a body of a lion. It is believed that the riddle of the Sphinx is to tell us where to start and where it ends. That the Sphinx wow. was made to show how to study the stars. You start with the, the woman, you start with that head of the woman, that's the virgin, and you'll end up with the body of the lion. Just I interesting. Was, I had no just idea they connected with the Bible. I thought it was just all evil. You know? They take it, warp it, make it all evil. And their <laughs> intent was to worship the, the, the woman and to worship the lion. It wasn't to worship the God who created but we can see, you know, that it is a hint that this is a good place to start. Well, what kind of surprises me, if you go to Israel where baby Jesus was born, they have an outline of a son around where he's born. And, he's supposed, and what is the purpose of that? That is Catholic. That oh, it is, is Catholic. yes, it has 14 oh. points that refer to the 14 stages in his life. Um, it is their glorification of the spot. That's not biblical. Oh, it's, it's just not biblical. no. Okay, because no. I've wondered where did they come up no. with that? No, he was born in a in a stable. Right. He was laid in a trough. Mm -hmm. They'll show you and say he was born at this spot and he was laid over here. Mm -hmm. Now, if you push everything back, it is a cave that sheep were kept in. So it could be the right area. It could be, and we know he was born in Bethlehem. That's all we know. Mm -hmm. We don't know the exact spot. But they come in as is common in, and I don't mean this, I'm not coming as anybody who is Catholic, but Catholicism loves to worship. Unfortunately, the worship goes beyond God, and they worship things and the places, and they make it ornate and all that. So they've built a huge church up over this area. They worship the spot I saw, um, a nun like they were in olden days, you know, dress where you knew she was a nun. I saw her come in when I was there, prostrate herself on the ground, kiss that very spot. She thinks she's kissing the spot where where the Lord was born. So it's Catholic. Yes. The star is Catholic. Yes. Yes. I mean the sun. Yeah. The sun. Yeah. The the I design. Why, around. So what's that got to do with the Lord being it's just, born? It it's just their way of, of glorifying the spot. Okay, let me finish, tie it up in these verses. Isaiah 34, 4 and 8. 34, 4 says, The heavenly lights will wear away. 
sun, moon, stars are going to wear away. The sky will be rolled up like a scroll. Remember I just said the heavens is like a scroll that we're going to unroll and tell. Mm -hmm. All its lights will also wither away as a leaf withers from the vine or as one withers from the fig tree. We're seeing that it's, it's not going to stay forever. Verse 8 tells us when this happens. The Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of retribution for the cause of Zion. His stream will be turned. Oh, go, we go on from there. Okay, so we know when the Lord's day of vengeance happens, we're going to see the, the, the um, corruption of what we just read in verse 4. The lights withering and all of that happening, the sky being rolled up. We read this also in Revelation 6, 14. This is our last verse to look at today. Revelation 6, verses 14 to 17. Very quickly tell us. Bless you. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it's rolled up. Every mountain island was removed from its place. The kings of the earth, the eminent people, commanders, wealthy, strong, also slave, free person. They hid themselves in the caves. Remember I read this earlier? They asked the mountains to fall on us, hide us from the sight of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, who can stand? So this is talking about the wrath is to come. Isaiah 34, 8 said when that wrath comes, verse 4, the heavens are going to fade. They're going to be rolled up like a scroll. We're going to see that all of this is going to be finished, that the prophecy it's telling is going to have been completed, and it's going to be rolled up like a scroll that has been finished now, and, and the demise of it. That's why we see in Revelation 21 a new heavens and a new earth. And I just got to wonder what map is he going to roll out there for us in eternity future. If this one tells now, I think he could have another scroll to teach us another whatever he has planned for us that we don't know. That's it. We are ready to start next week. So those maps that I gave you, hold on to them. You can see the, the 12 major constellations that we do know called the Zodiac. We will start with um, Virgo because that does seem to be the right place to start. So we will look at Virgo and the constellations that fall under her. We will see from the very first prophecy in scripture how it relates. We'll see certain stars in Virgo. We'll look at their names and what those names mean. And we will be well on our way to getting the idea of how the gospel is told in those stars. Okay? Are we good? <laughs> Any questions, comments? I'm sorry, I know I ran us over. I'm trying real hard to, to confine us more, but I wanted to get to completion. Yes, Ruth, unmute yourself, and you have the floor. You okay, can you, you hear me? Now we can. Okay. Um, you had mentioned that um, the beginning of the zodiac is Virgo. I don't know what all the signs are. That's and that the, the end is Leo, the lion, right. and Virgo represents the virgin. Right. What are the representations for the other, um, the other ten zodiac? We'll talk with each one at each time. I will tell you what it looks like and what it's okay. represented, because each one is going to represent a part of our Lord's um, gospel that he's telling us. That's why we do start with his virgin birth. That's where it all begins, is in his virgin birth. And, the, and we'll look at that. But we're going to see that was first prophesied in Genesis 3. We're going to go right back to the very beginning. We'll look at the virgin. We know that in the end, in his second coming, he comes back to rule and reign like the lion, king of the jungle. That's why it's the right place to end. Because we end with his second coming. We end with the, the millennial reign. I don't know who's got so, I lost you. Got, yeah, I'm sorry. We've got so much interference here. I'm having a hard time hearing myself. So what we do is we're going to stop and look at 12 different pictures of the different part telling the story, telling the gospel story from beginning to rule and reign in eternity. Go ahead, Ruth. We'll unmute you again. And I mute again. You got muted. Roger, I had to mute everybody to get the, the background out. So unmute yourself again. Sorry. Still not there. Try again, Ruth. <clears throat> unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. 
what never ceases to amaze me is how everything, everything, everything on this earth has everything to do with God. Absolutely. I mean, that never ceases to amaze me. Absolutely. I would have never have attached the Zodiac to God because I know it's fortune telling and all that, but right. you never hear about how this hooks up to God and his creation. Right. And his life, most important, right. his life. Right. Satan's done a great job of bringing the counterfeit lie out to the world. It is astrology, and I tell you, stay away from it. I'm glad you don't know all the signs because that tells me you stay away from it. That, unfortunately, the world is full of that knowledge, and it's not full of the knowledge of the Lord. It's not full of the truth. How can you call out the counterfeit? You need to know the truth. How do they call out a counterfeit bill? They study the real bill. They study till they know the real so well that they can point out that false, that fake. And that's fake. how they deceive you. And, yeah. I'm the yeah. fish, so that makes me, that means Jesus. <laughs> fish means okay. Jesus. Pam's saying that she's the sign, that, that it's the picture of that sign is the fish, and she says, that's Jesus, so I'm the sign of Jesus. We're going to look at that. That's called <laughs> Pisces. You're going to see it's got more meaning than you know, oh. and you're going to see what slice of the Lord that that's telling us about. Because that's how God gave them everything. And yes, everything on this earth. I think if our eyes were open to the truth, everything is declaring the glory of our God. Wow. Yeah. It is, it's a wow, isn't it? It's a wow. It's a wow. It's a wow. It's a wow. Yes. Maria, unmute yourself. Bye, Emily. Glad you made it. Bye. Bye. You know, it, it, it really amazes me, uh, like you said, that uh, Satan always uses the goodness of God uh, and to it. deceive, yes. you know, uh, his purpose, because there is a purpose in everything that he does, yes. and he makes, yes. and, and, and now it makes sense why the world is so much into the um, astrology, yeah, the and not yeah, the astronomy. The cult. Yes, yeah, yeah, and go all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden, well, how did he get Eve? He deceived her, but he took the truth. You know, God said, you'll know, you know, you won't die. You're going to know. You're going to be like God. Well, there was some truth in there. Their eyes were open to more knowledge. It's just not the knowledge that we want to be open to because it, it leads into the pit of death, you know. And, and it, yeah, and also, you know, like people, um, they, they look for this um, astrology to look for their sign because he knows that we are so eager to know what is in the future what is and yes. in for us right and you if know? you're taught that it's in relation to the stars when the stars are in the right place you should get a new job you should do, you know get married you should do this oh and make sure you marry somebody that's in a sign that's compatible with your sign yeah, yeah. we want we want the crystal ball we want to know right. and we want to do things but, in relation but, but at the same but at the same time it points uh, out to us that it, it, it is necessary for us to seek the lord on a daily basis oh absolutely not the you know? false lie, but the truth. He knows. He says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He tells us, commit your way into the Lord. Trust in Him. He tells us that the Word is a light unto our feet, a lamp unto our path. Yes, that's where we need to be. That's where the study needs to be. And as we look at the astronomy, we're going to look at it in Scripture. I think, and I don't mean this as any compliment to myself. It's not because I didn't come up with this. But I think we have laid down an excellent foundation scripturally. We see in scripture God's astronomy now. Your eyes are going to be open to it all the more as you're going to read verses on your own in different states and things are going to go, oh wow, there's the astronomy of God again that we just didn't see and know before. But when we were introduced to this study, we do see it. God has laid out what we need to know. He's given us the plan of the future. He's not given us every day what's going to happen in our day because he wants us, as Maria just said, 
every day look to him every day be into his word every day be getting our direction from him so that we stay on the right path so we don't deviate and if you for a moment look to have something else to tell you they look to the stars to tell them they're looking at what god created instead of at god the creator we want to always look at the creator not at what he created and Romans 1, I should bring that up very clearly, shows how the base had become lower and lower and lower. What they first worship, and, and all the way down to finally, they're, they're worshiping bugs. And we see that today. The they're worshiping creepy, crawly things. They the worship trees. the trees. They worship, you know, because in man it's is an innate need to worship. It's just we need to know the truth and worship the truth. That's what fills that, that inner void that everybody's trying to fill with something. And it's God-shaped when you fill it with God, the God who is the creator, the one true and living God, the God who is alive, the God who is orchestrating that future, who planned it, who keeps it in order, who sees to it that it ends. That's amazing in itself. You could create a whole story for your life. You could say, I'm going to do this and this and this and that. And you can start well on your path, but someone can throw a monkey wrench in. And you don't get to go in that direction. It changes everything. How many times has the life of a person been changed in an instant? By a diagnosis, by the death of someone, by some unknown, by a loss of a job or something. And all of a sudden they're scrambling. Only God can lay out a plan for everyone throughout all time and nothing changes it. And how do I know that? Because the Word of God tells it ahead, and it happens exactly how it said. Never has one word failed that's been told in the future. That's why I said, again, look at prophecy. If you don't want to believe in God, what are you going to do with prophecy? How can it be foretold and be so exact if God isn't so? I rest my you know, and, and it's so true, um, you know, like, like the, the Proverbs say that the, don't worry about tomorrow because each day has their own trouble. And, you know, it just brought me back to yesterday. Um, I was with my granddaughter because I had to take her somewhere. She was buying some things and all of a sudden I got this, this message in my, uh, my text that it said that I was overdrawn on my account. And I thought, how can I be the overdrawn? So what happened, my dearest friend, which I have my, my, uh, my cell phone account through her business, she paid her bill over, you know, her for $144 and used my account, uh, you know, by mistake. And I was thinking, oh, Lord, you knew this was going to happen. And here I am. And, and, you know, to top it all off, I was working uh, uh, with my accounts, you know, my, my checking and savings. And I don't know what I did, but I blocked my savings so I couldn't even move money from my checking from my savings to my to my checking because she sent she didn't send it to me to through uh, sell she sent it to me Apple Pay so you have to pay four dollars and fifty cents to get it right away or to wait three days <laughs> I said but you know it, it, monkey the wrench. wonderful thing monkey the wrench. wonderful thing yeah that you know it it, it was something uh, that it, it could be fixed Mm -hmm. But I didn't know, but God knew. Yes, yes, yes. And God's in control, and he works all those things out for you. He takes care of you. We can all tell stories, but the one that, that just hits me real quick, and if anyone needs to go, I'll close in prayer after this, but um, just to show you God's perfect timing. My mom and dad's life is full of these stories. My mom wrote it in a book. It's down for the record, but um, what I think of at this moment in time, God was working in two people's lives. My dad is in Greece. He believes that God has shown him that he is to be in Israel on June 29th. He goes to the airport to make the reservation because that's how he did it back in 1953. And he goes to make his reservation. He's told there's no flight. He goes back home and goes into prayer. He says, God, I thought you showed me I'm to be on, you know, I need to be on a plane that gets me into Israel on June 29th. Not June 28th, not June 30th, June 29th. He goes back to, to the airport or whatever, you know, where he's making reservations. And he gets, oh, well, yeah, yeah there is a flight, but it's all full. And he goes back and he prays again. He says, God, if, if I heard you right and I'm to be on that plane, you can put me on that plane. He goes back his third time. Oh, there's just been a cancellation. You can have it. 
So he gets on that plane to get him from Greece to Israel on the day that God said. They're flying into Israel. They'll land in Israel at nighttime, June 29th. <clears throat> they sit on the tarmac. They sit and they sit and they sit and they sit. They sit so long that now on a normal flight, they are going to land in Israel on June 30th. And my dad puts a prayer up to heaven again. God, I don't get it. You told me June 29th. You know what you could do, God? You could put a tailwind on this plane, push it through the heavens, and have it land in Israel on June 29th like you promised me. A few minutes after he prayed that prayer silently in his heart, the stewardess was going by, and he tapped her, and he says, How are we doing? And she says, Do you know we pick up a tremendous tailwind? We're picking up time. We're going to land in Israel before midnight. And they landed uh, uh, between 11.30 and midnight on June 29th. Oh God pushed a plane through the air <laughs> to keep his word to the oh one that God. he had given it to. And at the same time, my mom has come from a whole different area. She's come from the United States, coming to Israel. Mm -hmm. As far as my dad knows, because they knew each other, they knew of their love for Israel, but as far as my dad knows, my mom is not making it to Israel. He's making it. He's just landed and even thought of my mom, and he thought, poor girl, she'll never make it, you know, and here I am. Well, she, on her, in her excitement, her enthusiasm, she has left. She's in her, her early 20s. She has taken a number of planes to get to Israel because that's how you do it. When she got landed in Germany, by that point, no more English speaking people on the plane, no English signs. All of a sudden she realizes, I am very much alone. I am female and I am alone. No one knows I'm coming to Israel. She had been told there was a hotel at the airport where she could stay. It wasn't true. So she was going to have to, to go out of the airport to find a place to stay that night. Because remember, she's coming in late at night also. And from Germany into Israel, she said it was one long prayer meeting. And she said to the Lord, no one knows I'm coming that you could have someone there at that airport to meet me right there at the airport. They come in, they come in just before midnight on June 29th. They taxied out and they're told that everybody's to wait on the plane, they're, they're not to go into the custom building, custom's going to come out, deal with them on the plane, and then they can go in. A few minutes later, someone comes out and says, they've changed their mind, everybody's to go into the customs building. So this plane empties its people about the same time that the plane my dad was on emptied their people, and they're all coming into the customs building together, and in the middle of these two groups conversing, is <laughs> my mom would tell the story, and I see my dad to this day, all of a sudden, the middle of that group comes open, and here is my dad, my mom coming face to face with my dad, and he's, he's like, <laughs> total shock, like, are you kidding me? And he told her later, he said, I had just thought about you, felt sorry for you that you weren't going to make it, and all of a sudden, here you are in living color. Wow. Well, guess what? <laughs> My dad knew Yiddish, she knew Hebrew, he knew enough, he was able to help my mom, the two of them, leave the airport together and find accommodations for the night. And she said, I was like the children of Israel following Moses. My first days in Israel could have been a nightmare and I was having the time of my life. God moved in people in my mom's life and what they did with the customs to bring that group together. He pushed the plane through the air to put my dad there to answer a little girl's prayer that said, nobody knows I'm coming, but you can have somebody there for me. That's yes. our awesome yes. wow. God. And that's just but one you... instant in their lives. Wow. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Rochelle. I, I, <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm going. I'm way over. Let's, I know thank I'm way you over. So much. I think we'll right. leave up these Shall testimonies. Everyone? Roger, when you put it up, leave up the testimonies. I'll close in prayer now. Those who need to go, go. But I'll be short. Lord God, we praise you. We thank you. You are awesome, ineffable, amazing, and your plan and your time is perfect in all of our lives. Lord, let us yield to you, be led by you, allow you to be God in our lives that we can rejoice in the God of our salvation and be led into the perfect plan for us and home with you one day. Praise you, thank you, hallelujah. In the name of Yeshua Jesus, amen. Amen.